Aloha, and welcome to this special episode of Figments on Reality. I'm your host, Dan Leaf, and uh, go by Fig. 33 years in the Air Force, a long time in national security matters, and that's why I'm so interested in this topic. I hope you are too, because today's special episode is part two of a discussion of, of the failure in Afghanistan, the many facets of it, and especially the situation during the withdrawal. Uh, it is, as always, going to be a non-political uh, discussion because I don't think it helps. And I'll try to avoid vitriol. Lame around, but it crosses party lines. And the political capital or of one or other side should not be a consideration in this critical time that's so consequential to us that we, sh we should all be concerned. And frankly, when I watch news stories about the trivial stuff that gets into the news these days, it just, it makes me mad. Uh, the public and the government need to put politics aside at this time because it matters greatly for our country and for the world. And in the closing, I'll talk about exactly why that is. Now, many of you know that today there was a deadly attack at the Kabul aircraft airport uh, near the Abbey Gate, as it's called. At last report, 12 U.S. Marines and one Navy corpsman were killed in this attack. Tens, maybe hundreds of Afghans as well. Uh, I've seen some video, I imagine that many of you have as well, and it's just horrific. I cannot imagine the final seconds of our 12, 13 service members, the last 12 or uh, last seconds of their lives, or the coming days, weeks, and months for their families. And... Uh, Let's honor them by thinking deeply about this and trying to find ways to do better in the immediate and long-term future. Clearly, we have lost the initiative in Afghanistan and we must take it back. And not we, the president, not we, the military, not we, one party or the other, the big we. It's in everybody's interest to go forward and make the best of a very bad situation. We owe that to our country. We also owe it to the many Afghans who supported us and are uh, even loosely aligned with U.S. efforts there because they're deeply at risk. Today, I exchanged changed messages with a, an Afghan friend of mine, good guy, who is hiding because he supported U.S. efforts there for well over a decade. And he sent me documents that he hoped would facilitate him getting through the gates at the airport and getting out of Afghanistan. And he's not a quitter. He's just at great risk. He said to me when he sent these as, as pictures via message, he said, if they see these pictures, they being the Taliban, they direct hanging me. In other words, if, if the Taliban sees that he's even communicating with the US, he believes he'll be dead. And I've heard from other friends similar stories. And we have a moral obligation to these people to try to save them. We can't save all of them. But every Afghan who's at risk because of their support of the United States that can get out, can be gotten out, we should do that. And we should take risk as we did today to do so. Uh, now, there's a great risk that there'll be infiltrators, terrorists, bad guys in those who escape. We have to take that risk and counter it appropriately. Uh, there is no perfect situation here, but uh, we put them at risk by being in their country and by asking their help, which they gave, and we owe them a chance to survive and really to thrive. So as I look at this withdrawal, and most of the terms that I would use to describe it are quite impolite, so I'll just say it's a disaster. Um, I have to make assumptions as I look at this, and uh, the assumptions are that, uh, first of all, it probably could not have been done worse. I, I mean, really, if you look at it got a couple pictures here from the early days of the chaotic withdrawal of the images now. I mean, this is already chaos, especially the picture on the right, and they come from our Department of Defense. But the uh, 
I haven't had direct involvement in it, so let me make some assumptions for how this happened. And uh, the first thing I wanna address is what the question is. And the question is not whether or not we should, whether or not it's a political failure, it's, it's everybody's failure, everybody's failure. The intelligence community, the elected leaders in charge, and the military. It's a total failure of the US national security community. And to try to shift blame is um, really a, a terrible thing. And uh, we ought not do it. So let's not, and let's ask what happened here. And I think uh, it, there's a meme going on that going around that I modified and took the politics out of. And uh, it talks about what common sense would have dictated in terms of the withdrawal and what was actually done. And, you know, I'm, I've been involved in a couple of conflicts and a lot of planning and operations execution. And those items on the left are so obvious to me, it's stunning that we didn't at least come close to that. Uh, first of all, don't let your enemy, and I'll talk more about setting a calendar deadline, don't let your enemy uh, have ultimate flexibility by going in the best season for them. So winter would have been a fine time to initiate the withdrawal. Um, you've got to maintain support to the, the Afghan forces, intelligence and air support, so that they have some hope of succeeding in their efforts to maintain viability and for the government to stay in power. And then the one that really startles me is the failure to execute a non-combatant evacuation order, uh, non-combatant uh, operations uh, plan. NEO is uh, required, I think, in every U.S. embassy, certainly any that I've been associated. In case things turn bad, you have to be prepared to evacuate non-combatants. And as far as I can tell, in the planning for this withdrawal, that was never conceded or executed. Next, we, we, know, we knew we were leaving a lot of valuable and a, a capable military equipment in the hands of the Af Afghan National Army. We also knew that, that some of that could fall into the hands of the enemy. And why we weren't prepared to disable it and destroy it if necessary, I absolutely don't know. I, I simply do not know where that failure occurred. It's unimaginable to me. Um, I mean, truly unimaginable. The, uh, the failure to be prepared for worst case is anti-theatical, so uncharacteristic of the US military I served in. I, I just I can't explain it. And then we should have proceeded with our withdrawal in the right order with the military last. Because as we proved by having to get forces back in, uh, getting the military out first is backwards. And then the airfield operations, there's much debate now. Uh, President Biden in his remarks today said the military suggested that the Bagram airfield was not of much utility. Um, okay. I'm not sure I agree with that assessment, but uh, more airfields are better. Airfield operations in any case should have been protected and maintained to the finish. And instead we left precipitously and didn't maintain that, that capability and have had to reestablish what operational capability and what security we could for the airfield in Kabul. Um, you know, you, you see my assessment as, exer as uh, listed over there, the withdrawal as executed. We told the Taliban what we were going to do. We terminated Bagram, right or wrong, apparently wrong, I'd say. We terminated our support to the Afghan National Army and they collapsed. And we withdrew the US military. Now we're, with re we're reacting to every, everything since. We had to put forces back in. We're trying to search for, locate, and facilitate the withdrawal of Americans and at-risk Afghans. And furthermore, we're going to have to respond 
to a better equipped Taliban and the potential for genocide and atrocities on their part and a resurgence of terrorism. The Biden administration is saying that this attack today in Kabul was done by ISIS-K. Um, th this is, won't be the last we hear of that threat because of the failed withdrawal. Now, why did this happen? First of all, I think some people, well, I, I, in my first episode, I spoke about hubris, um, and I, it's a word that fits, frankly. I'll let you read that and not talk about it much, but I think because we thought we could, uh, we thought we could get away with it, and clearly we were wrong. But there must have been bad assumptions. Some in the national security community, be there, be they military or civilian, must have given bad advice. And we were in a hurry because we'd imposed calendar constraints on, uh, on ourselves. A self-inflicted wound, the calendar constraints. And maybe we just hoped it would go okay. The hope, as the military cliche goes, is not a plan. Um, and we may not have anticipated the precipitous collapse of the Afghan government and the Afghan National Army, but we should have in worst case planning and um, simply based on decades of experience there. It's a fragile country that some argue isn't even a country and doesn't have the fabric to be a country. That's again, it's not no disrespect for Afghans. It, it's just, it's a very difficult environment to govern or to protect. Yeah. But the fundamental failure in my mind was the calendar-based withdrawal on any date. And yes, the Trump administration for initiating that idea and the Biden administration for continuing it, their responsibility. The president today talked again about what he inherited. I don't care. I mean, he is the president. And again, this is not a political statement, but a calendar-based uh, operation is flawed. You, you give up all surprise because you tell the enemy, and uh, I don't know if the administration views them as, as the enemy, but they certainly know that the Taliban is not, are not friends, and so stated today in both his briefing and in the press secretary's briefing, why would we want to telegraph a date certain for the withdrawal? It's, it does not make military sense. I don't think it makes strategic sense either. Uh, it should be condition-based. The other thing you do, um, by the way, when you state a date certain is you constrain everything you do and deny uh, yourself the ability to react to changes in the environment or the situation. And uh, your conditions should be what determine when you withdraw. The conditions can be going through the steps of that common sense withdrawal that I discussed, making sure that you have the NEO plan, non-combatant evacuation operations plan in place that you are ready to deal with potential loss of valuable military equipment, that you have security and have prepared for security of airfields and are well prepared and situated for evacuation operations, which anybody should have been able to look at and say, this will require some significant evacuation, no matter what. Because even if the entire country had not fallen to the Taliban, there was going to be some displacement as, as the Taliban moved in, into the void that required some evacuation. Um, so this wasn't done. Um, and what do we do now is the next question. And that's where I'd like us to focus, not on the assessment of blame because that's not very productive, but on the, what do we do with this current situation to make it less bad? The first is we ought not, as I said in part one of this, we ought not seek success in the withdrawal and the evacuation. Okay, it's a bad situation. 
the uh, military has done an incredible job with our NATO, NATO partners of getting a vast number of US and other people out of Afghanistan. It's a gargantuan effort, uh, very well executed in extraordinarily difficult situations. That's not something to celebrate. We did it because of an initial failure. So, so acknowledge the contribution of the people who've executed the evacuation operations, but don't make it the focus of the discussion. Secondly, today, after the attack, there was a lot of discussion by both the president and his press secretary about avenging the attack on, um, on our Marines and the Navy corpsmen and the Afghan civilians, don't forget. And um, yeah, we need to respond. We need to respond as a matter of deterrence, not punishment, to deter future attacks and to impose some cost and to validate the sacrifice of our service members. But we ought not do it for the bitter taste of revenge. And we ought not do it to claim success in something. It needs to be done, but it's not, a, not an immediate priority. And it ought not be something to say, hey, look, you know, we got them. Well, they got us first. We need to deter future attacks, protect the current operation, and finish the job. Um, we're going to have to communicate with the Taliban. The president has acknowledged that. Uh, and we, we need to do that because they're a reality. We can't wish for an alternate reality in Afghanistan where the Taliban aren't in power, or aren't um, running what security there is there. But we ought to coordinate with them as only, only as necessary and absolutely not negotiate. The time for negotiation is done. Now they hold some cards. So when we ask why we're talking to the Taliban um, and why that was a factor in sticking to the current August 31st deadline, I don't know, but I would speculate that uh, Taliban threats to exact a cost on civilians and remaining US personnel if we extended the deadline, might be part of that. Okay, We're, we have to deal with that reality, but not by negotiating. So um, we can't wish away the Taliban, as I said, and we need to acknowledge the reality that they're currently in power and we have some work to do. And let me talk about that work to do and about the next steps that, that should come. The first and most important thing uh, needs to be to use a skill that seems to be lost in our country, and that's admit mistakes. Okay, this has gone very, very badly. So there were mistakes, and we need our leaders, civilian and military, to acknowledge them and not try to turn them into successes or to explain them by blaming them on others, and uh, I mean both sides of the aisle. Everybody here has a part of everybody in the national security community on any side of the aisle, whether they're in power now or in the past, has responsibility, so own up to it. There's a very good article by General Ben Hodges, Army General, I, I didn't know General Hodges, but he talked about his role in Afghanistan and, uh, and admitted mistakes. It was refreshing. It's very much needed. We, we, the poll numbers don't matter, right? It's not an election year, and this matter is far more important than how the poll numbers look. So please admit your mistakes. Again, as much as possible, we need to re-seize the initiative, and that coming through man, comes through mandating, not negotiating conditions, uh, to the maximum extent possible. We can undo some of the mistakes that have been made by completing the evacuation, no matter how long it takes. And um, well, I'm not sure if we're totally stuck with the 31 August deadline, but deadline notwithstanding, however we do it notwithstanding, we need to complete the evacuation. The administrative administration is committed to that with regard to US persons who want to leave. 
but we need to be broader in our consideration of what completing the evacuation means. Um, we should commit to save all Afghans. All special immigrant visa applicants should be welcome to the United States, not approved, but applicants. And uh, there's an excellent article uh, by Joan Barker in the Military Times on, on the responsibility for both sides regarding special immigrant visa applicants and the blame, frankly. Those are people who applied to come to the United States and uh, due to some restrictions placed upon it by the Trump administration uh, and, and in action, perhaps on the Biden administration, didn't have their visas granted. If they applied, we should bring them to the United States or a third country and sort it out. We can't wait for them because they won't survive. We need to constrain the Taliban in every way possible. Um, the, they, as President Biden said today, uh, have interests and we should affect those interests and we have the means to do it. They, their interests include staying in power. Okay, we can put their staying in power at risk without launching another war. They include money, the economy that they need to function. Um, and most importantly, there's the US military equipment that they have. I hope, I don't know, not in government or military service anymore, um, I hope that there's planning for a massive campaign from the air to destroy the remaining U.S. military equipment. The, a the a Afghan National Army has ceased to exist, so nothing good is going to come from the ground equipment, the small arms, the weapons, or the aircraft that remain there. And we have the capability to go in and systematically destroy it. Uh, there would be some risk, especially if the Taliban were notified ahead of time that we're going to do that. So if anybody in the national security apparatus is listening, I hope they quickly put this into a deeply classified uh, planning process. But either um, as a preemptive effort or in response to Taliban bad behavior, all of that stuff to the maximum degree possible should go away. We can do that. And frankly, I'm not sure why it hasn't started already again, perhaps because we're, we're necessarily dependent on Taliban facilitation of the evacuation operations. Um, finally, we have to commit to save all the Afghans who are at risk because of their association with us. Remember what my friend said, if they saw the pictures he sent, which were you know, passport, passport photos, um, letters of appreciation from the U.S. side for what he had done, he'd be killed. Okay, there are tens of thousands of people in Afghanistan at similar risk. Uh, we need to find a way to do everything we can. And one of the ways to do that is to establish a point of contact in U.S. government for people like me to reach out and say, here's a name for you. Here's somebody who needs to be helped. Here's somebody hiding in his closet or basement or her closet or basement, uh, because I've had several people reach out with the same desperation for people they've been associated with. I hope uh, on my next figments, The Power of Imagination, to speak to a retired U.S. soldier who's deeply concerned about the Afghans who've facilitated not just his mission, but his survival on 15 deployments to Afghanistan. Not long, not 15 years, but 15 trips to Afghanistan. And he's heart sick about the fate of these people. It won't take much once the US is truly gone and once this fades through the headlines for an Afghan to be summarily killed, murdered, tortured by the Taliban because they have some connection with the, uh, with the U.S. efforts there. Now, so we should establish a point of contact. I should be able to pick up the phone or send an email to 
Afghan Refugees App, whatever, .gov, a government effort, and they need to put the manpower, person power, and resources to making this part of the effort to get it right in the end. Um, so I always close with what would FIG do? Here's what I'd ask you to do is shed your politics. They don't matter. This is too important. Um, and there'll be plenty of time for blaming. You can blame people at the ballot box, but for the 13 dead today, for all of the dead Afghans, those at risk, and for the lives that were lost in preceding 20 years, politics don't matter. Um, this is hugely important and it might seem kind of remote. Afghanistan's a long way away. Maybe you didn't know anybody who served, uh, but this is how we recover from the initial failure of the withdrawal. It's going to have significant influence on the US role in the world. It's been oft said here in the Pacific that while China is the preferred economic partner, often by necessity of many countries, the U.S. is always the preferred security partner. First of all, because we're generally ethical, we're usually competent, and we generally stay committed. Okay, we're failed the last two so far. We have to recover from that failure because we're a force for good when we act as America should. And now it's time, apolitically, to act as America should and finish this job as well as we can. So may God bless the souls of our servicemen and of the Afghans who were lost today and comfort their families in this terrible time. And may we pull together to get it as right as we can. Um, thank you for watching this episode of Figments on Reality. Uh, I'll be back Monday with another Figments on Reality on military accountability that talks to who should be held accountable and how you do that in the US military. More how you do that, how it works and why it needs to be done. I'd like to thank Figment, Fig, or sorry, Think Tech Hawaii for letting me present my views as a citizen journalist and urge you to support this great nonprofit organization that gives many of us voice on things we care about. So thank you and aloha. <laughs>